said, perfect pairing for our July event. Um, he is a Brooklyn historian, and he's been giving tours on many of Brooklyn's historic communities, such as Flatbush. He's also given tours of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, he's been featured in major news publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Daily News. So, John, teacher for 39 years. <laughs> That's not how I became this historian. Um, um, my wife and I, how many of you saw the movie Dirty Dancing? That's how my wife met my, my wife and I. We were both working at the same hotel in the Catskills in 1965, and I fell in love with her blue eyes, and we got married in 69, we're married now 55 years. Uh, That's how we met. All right. Now, um, our first apartment was in Flatbush. She grew up in Brighton Beach, which is next to Coney Island. And I grew up a couple of miles just north of where she grew up in Brighton Beach, right in the, right in the middle of Brooklyn. And um, after our honeymoon, we said, let's walk around. We were living in an apartment house, in a one-bedroom apartment. And uh, let's see where's the shopping, the movie theaters on Flatbush. There were like five movie theaters on Flatbush Avenue. They're all gone now, except one was resurrected, the Louise King's Theater. It's magnificent. It opened in 1929, and it completely restored, completely. It's unbelievable. So let's walk around. Where's the nearest subway station? So we started walking through the streets, and we're seeing these big, beautiful Victorian and Queen Anne, gorgeous houses with columns and lawns and tree line. I said, wait a second, these are the houses we see from the subway. Because the subway tracks, and I'll show you some pictures shortly, the subway tracks go from Brighton Beach all the way to Prospect Park, and then it goes into a tunnel, okay? And then either in a tunnel or over a bridge, depending on which line you're traveling on. And from the train, when it goes through Flatbush, you look out the window, and you see these big, magnificent homes. We didn't know where that was, and yet we were living in Brooklyn, but now we were living in that neighborhood. And I started to get interested in the architecture and the history. Well, to make a long story short, I started doing research and collecting. Um, I started going to the, the New York International Postcard Show and collecting postcards, early 20th century views of of Brooklyn street scenes. Um, and some of these postcards are of the homes in Flatbush when they were first being built at the turn of the century. Uh, plus, I got in touch with other people who had collections and started buying from them. And I started to put it all together and I started doing slideshows at Flatbush. But my wife was from Brighton Beach, so I said, you know, let them do Brighton Beach. And I started collecting Brighton Beach. You know, that's right next to Coney Island. So I started to do Coney Island. I said, the hell with it? Let me do Brooklyn. So that's how it all started. Um, the, there were five boroughs. Each borough president, by law, must appoint a county historian. I'm the one for Kings County. Every county in the state of New York must have a county historian. And our salary is that. <laughs> it's an appointed position. But Marty Markowitz, the guy who appointed me in 2002, we've known each other since 1974. Um, we both graduated the same year from Brooklyn College, but we didn't know each other because we were taking different programs. Um, so we know each other now 50 years. All right? um, and he knew of my interest in the history and the collections and everything. He knew I did tours. And I've been on TV and all that. So he said, would you like to be the historian for Brooklyn? I said, well, don't tell John Manbeck, because I replaced John Manbeck as a historian. All right? And, and John Manbeck was the historian for nine years. Now this is my 22nd year. After Marty Markowitz stopped being the borough president, 
Eric Adams, who's now the mayor of New York City, he was the borough president of Brooklyn. So he kept me on in the position, although I had absolutely no dealings with him whatsoever. And now the next borough president is Antonio Reynoso. He's younger than my oldest son. He didn't even know there was a position of historian. He knows it now. Okay. So that's how I got where I am today. Um, and the job of the historian is to be available to the media in case they need information regarding the history of this or that block or this house or that building. Um, <clears throat> individual buildings I can't help them with. They have to contact the New York City Buildings Department. All right? But the history of neighborhoods, street, the names of the streets, there, there's a book called Brooklyn by Name. All right? They, you go to that. I have that book. And there's a book I have. Um, I didn't bring the book with me, but I gave Mary Kay two pages from the book, page 100 and 101. It's a 160-page book. It's called um, Flatbush of Today. It was pu published in 1908. And these two pages are about Mr. T.B. Ackerson. All right? He was one of the biggest developers and builders in what we now call Victorian Flatbush. Because these homes were built at the end of the Victorian era. Queen Victoria died, I think, in 1902, 1903. And that's when these, this area of Brooklyn was being built up and developed. Why did the developers buy up the land over there? Because transportation was already in place. Why did Ackerson come out here? Because you had the Long Island Railroad here already. And people wanted to go elsewhere Hop on the Long Island Railroad, okay? Transportation was in place, and I'll show you the pictures. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge opened in 1883. That started the influx of overcrowded lower Manhattan to easily get across into Brooklyn without having to take a ferry. You can get on your, take your horse and wagon, pack everything in the wagon with the kids and, the, and all the belongings, Go across the Brooklyn Bridge, which had a toll, by the way. Each of the East River bridges, when they were built, the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883, the uh, Williamsburg Bridge opened in 1903, and the Manhattan Bridge in 1909, they had tolls on them. The tolls were eliminated in 1911. Okay, But they did have tolls, three cents, two cents, a nickel. That's what the tolls were back then. Um, so the bridge allowed overcrowded low Manhattan, the tenements, easy access to come into Brooklyn. Railroads already existed in 1883, okay? You had the Brooklyn Flappish and Coney Island Railroad, and that's where Atkinson and the other, other Flappish developers started to build their homes, right next to those tracks, okay? Um, you had the Long Island Railroad, which went right next to Flatbush. So people can go out to Long Island or come back from Long Island back into Brooklyn, all right? So transportation was very important for developers to buy up the farmland of Brooklyn. Mr. Atkinson purchased, um, he got his start, he was working at the Knickerbocker Ice Company in the 1890s in Brooklyn. And saved up some money, and he went to his boss. And he said, what should I do with what I saved up? His boss said two words, real estate. So Ackerson got the idea, and his first venture into real estate. It took him a year and a half to sell the house, and he made a $26 profit, okay? All right, I don't know if you know, uh, Flatbush Avenue, near Ocean Avenue, all right? Um, there, there was a house that he built there, and people said, it's too extravagant for this area. And that was, a, this, and that was in 1898, all right? A year and a half to sell it, and he made a $26 profit. So he ventured even further. He started to buy up some of the farmland. First, he bought some land um, from a Mr. I missed a lot, L-O-T-T. -T. You'll pardon the pun, there were a lot of lots in Brooklyn. Not only the land lots, but the family, the lot name. In fact, 
in, in the Marine Park section of Brooklyn, there's a Dutch farmhouse that still stands. It's the Henrik Lot farmhouse. All right? The east wing of that farmhouse was uh, built in 1719, and the rest was added on in 1800. <coughs> and it's still on its ex original plot, has never been moved. Originally, it had 200 acres. Now it's on a 160 by 160 lot. It is landmark. Uh, it has been, the exterior has been restored. The, uh, the landscaping has been done. And now they're going to be working on the interior. And then it'll be open to the public as a museum and ha have meetings. That's in the Marine Park section of Brooklyn. And there's still, today, about 10 Dutch and Dutch American farmhouses still standing in Brooklyn. The oldest is the oldest one in New York State, built in 1652. But that's moving away from what we're here for tonight. So um, in the heart of Brooklyn, in fact, I have a jacket. And on the back, it says Flatbush, the heart of Brooklyn. And that's where Flatbush is located. There were five Dutch towns when the Dutch arrived in the 1600s. Brooklyn, B-R-E-U-C-K-E-L-E-N. Vlachbos, these are the Dutch names of the towns, New Amersfoort, New Utrecht, Baswick, you're going to have to see where some of these names come from now. But when the English took over in 1664, they started to change some of the Dutch names. So Vlachbos became Flatbush, Baswick became Bushwick, okay? Uh, New Utrecht, still in Utrecht, named after the village of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And Brooklyn eventually became Brooklyn, named after the village of Brooklyn in the Netherlands. And incidentally, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, I assisted a Dutch historian named Bram Donkers. He's a historian and a documentary maker. And I took him around Dutch Brooklyn. He came back with his film crew in October of just before the pandemic. And, uh, uh, and I was able to get him into the Flatbush Dutch Reformed Church, which is the oldest church in Brooklyn. The original church on the site dates to 1654. And by the way, that's another reason that the developers started to develop, like Ackerson, right in Flatbush there. Because Ackerson's development is just a couple of blocks away from that church. So on the corner of Flappish Avenue and Church Avenue. Across the street is Erasmus High School where Barbara Streisand went. And that's the, old, the second oldest secondary school in the United States. It opened in 1787. Okay? So um, I, we were able to get into the church, into the graveyard. Many of the gravestones are engraved in Dutch. With the Dutch family names, they now have streets named after them in Flatbush. Ditmus, Cortelio. All right? So, and oh yeah, and Lot. I mentioned the name Lot, or a lot of Lot. Judge John Lot, Jeremiah Lot. And since today is um, Juneteenth, the last slave born in Flatbush was a gentleman named Uncle Sammy Anderson. He was born on Jeremiah Lot's farm on Flatbush Avenue and Quartelli Road. In, um, he died in 1902, so and he was about 92 years old when he died. He was born in 1810, all right? So he was the last. Slavery was abolished in New York State in 1827, long before the Civil War. So <clears throat> transportation was important. The developers started to buy up the farmland. Now, let me show you a couple of pictures. This is, all right, um, here are the train tracks right here. The tracks were on the street, by the way. It was a steam railroad. It was the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island Railroad. Hanging in my dining room frame is a stock certificate from that railroad dated September 1881. Five shares of stock at $100 a share. It's worthless today because that railroad doesn't exist anymore. That railroad ran from Prospect Park down to Brighton Beach, to the, to the ocean. And it wasn't a passenger railroad. 
It was an excursion railroad because what was down by the shore at the turn of the century? Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, Sheepshead Bay, and Coney Island, the biggest resort in the United States. And this Brooklyn Flappers and Coney Island Railroad took you there. All you had to do was, from Manhattan, go across the Brooklyn Bridge, get onto um, a bus or a trolley to the other side of the uh, Prospect Park, and you can get the Brooklyn Flappers and Coney Island Railroad right there, take it all the way down to the shore. So the developers knew this. The biggest resort transportation was already there. The farmland was available, and they started to build these beautiful developments. So here is the train tracks on the street, steam railroad. Now, it's off the picture here. This, this, this street here is Cortellian Road, okay? And this empty space right there, that's where I used to live. Mm -hmm. Right there. I'll show you a picture of the house in just a minute, all right? The houses are already under construction. This is 341 Rugby Road. I know Michael Levine lives there, and uh, Sue Ann lives in this house today. That's 317 Rugby Road. And uh, here's the sales office right here for Atkinson. Okay? By the way, this is Beverly Square West, 1901 to 1904. But he did Beverly Square East first, from 1899 to 1901. And that is the other side of the tracks, on this side, okay? But in Flatbush, where these beautiful homes are, the other side of the tracks is just as good as the other side of the tracks. You know, the expression is like, oh, he's from the other side of the track. But Flatbush, that's okay, all right? So, Marlboro Road. <clears throat> By the way, the streets originally East 11th, East 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, East 16th. But they wanted to attract the wealthy. So they got permission. Now, either Atkinson or another developer, Dean Albert, I don't know which one got the permission to give the streets English sounding names to attract doctors, lawyers, professional people. Well, it worked. Because East 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th are now in order, Stratford, Westminster, Argyle, Rugby, Marlborough, and Buckingham Roads, okay? So, uh, Atkinson's rival developers um, started to call Atkinson's development, because he developed a large part of Flatbush, Atkinson's Swarm of Bees. If you take the first letter of each named street, it spells out swarm and the letter B for Buckingham, okay? Atkinson Swarm of Bees. Off the picture here, this is Marlboro, Rugby, and then Argyle, okay? Between Argyle and Rugby, where this empty space is right here, just off the picture, stands Public School 139, okay? Now, Atkinson paid for about 12 acres of land right here. He bought Catherine, oh, another lot, Catherine Lot. He bought Catherine Lott's farm, about 10 or 12 acres, to $83,000, okay? And he proceeded to build. As the area was getting developed, not only by him, but by other developers at the same time, he needed a school. Well, Atkinson had property on between Rugby and Argyle right over here. So he sold it to the city of New York for $114,000. <laughs> and built PS 139, where my oldest son went to school. My wife was president of the Parents Association, because we lived right here at the time, you know, when, you, when we lived there. So what well, my wife had to do was walk two houses down, and there's the school, all right? So this is how Atkinson got started. Now the railroad, as the area was being built, and the school was being built, the kids had to walk across the tracks. Now, the tracks were not electric. It was a steam railroad. But eventually, they became electric. But not the tracks, overhead wires, like the trolleys. But it was a, it was a train, not a trolley. So if you wanted to cross the tracks, what do you do when you cross the street? You stop, and you look, and see. Well, that's what the kids had to do, crossing the tracks. 
If a train was coming, you wait. All right? And that's what happened. But as it got more developed and more people, the city told the owners of the railroad, you've got to get these tracks off the street. There was no subway system yet. Privately owned railroads. There was the Brooklyn Elevated Railway Company, the Brooklyn Flappers and Coney Island Railroad, and there were several others. You had the Rockaway Branch, and you also had the Long Island Railroad that went from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, near where the Arizona Bridge is, straight into Queens and into Long Island. And those tracks were on the street in Brooklyn, on the street. And it crossed, I don't know if you're Coney Island Avenue, I have a 1907 picture that shows the Charlie tracks on Coney Island Avenue and the Long Island Railroad tracks going right across it on the street. That was in 1907. But these had, they had to get them off the street because the area was being developed. Too many people became dangerous. So, let's go to the next picture. Put this one down. This is the Beverly Road Station, and the date is there, 1900. All right? This is like East 16th Street in Beverly Road. The homes you see here are not Atkinson's houses. Atkinson's houses are on this side, over here, off the picture. This area is called Prospect Park South, developed by a gentleman named Dean Alvord. All right? That community there is all landmark now. New York City Historic District, which means the homeowners cannot in any way change the exterior of the homes. They want to put an air conditioner in a wall, they can't. Put it in the window, you can't, because that can be removed. But some of the homes have air conditioners in the wall, because they were already there when the area was landmark. So the air conditioner is grandfathered in. But they can't do it today, all right? And by the way, we call Victorian Flatbush, we call it Hollywood East. A lot of motion pictures and TV shows are filmed there. It's cheaper than building a set. And I tell you that people get paid a lot of money for their homes being used. And I'll show you some movie lobby cards of one of the films that was filmed in Prospect mm -hmm. South. And you will know who the actress and actors are, okay? <coughs> All right? So here are the tracks on the street. Can you see how the tracks curve? You see it? All right? They're on the street. The railroad owners wanted to build an elevated railroad. And the people who were buying these homes, $7,000, $8,000, $10,000. Wait a second, we just spent $9,000 to buy this house and now you want to put this monstrosity literally in our backyards? An elevated railroad in their backyard. Well, the only option was to put the tracks 16 feet down uncovered. You see the curve in the track here? This is 1900. And here it is in 1916. See the same curve? Okay? The tracks are now eight, 16 feet down. Now it started with two tracks. One, two. One going north, one going south. But look at the this picture is 1912, by the way, this one. There's one, two, three, four. Now you had express and local tracks by 1912. Because the area needed, the population was exploding. Okay? So that was the transportation that attracted the people to buy the homes. Okay? Now, I mentioned Marlboro Road you saw in the picture. Marlboro Road in 1910. Plenty of coffee. No cars yet. There were cars around. There were cars around. Very few. Very few. Um, like horses and buggies? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, there were. In, in fact, I'm going to show you something very interesting in the picture. Um, there were horses and wagons, okay? And the horse and wagon pulled up in front of the house. I want you to notice where the trees are. They're not at the curb. They're on the lawn. You see that? You, most of the time in the city, trees are on the curb. Okay? Not on the lawns. Why did Atkinson do that? Well, if you're planting a seedling that's about this tall at the curb, 
Well, look, and someone comes along with a horse and rag, and the horse is parked right next to that ceiling, and it's eye level with the horse. She got it, right? They'll start nibbling on the branches and on the leaves. Two kinds of trees were planted. Norway maples and sycamore trees, or, or London plane trees. In Brooklyn, we call the London plane, we call those itchy bowl trees. You know those, the round seed packets? When we were kids, we would chase each other and drop the seed packet down the other guy's back, and they'd go like that, right? <laughs> All right? They were very soft seeds, but it made you twitch a little bit. So the, these are the sycamore trees. And you know what? They're still there. Ninety percent of the trees are still there, and over ninety-five percent of the homes are still standing. Okay, because storms can do damage. What happened out here during Sandy? Was it was it bad here? Yeah. Brooklyn got hit bad. Just on my block, one, two, four trees came down on my block. We did not lose electricity, although they fell on the electric wires. Uh, they didn't break the wires, all right? But that was fortunate. But the morning after the storm, my wife and I drove down to Brighton Beach, which had been flooded the night before. And we saw cars that were facing the wrong way. The trunks were open. These cars were floating. It's right by the Atlantic Ocean. They were floating. And the salt water short circuit the electrical system in the cars. The trunks popped open. There was sand all over the place, okay? Anyhow, Marlboro Road and this built, taller building here, that's on the corner of Cortelli Road, which is a commercial street. Lots of nice restaurants there. Okay? So, I'll take it. This is Beverly Square West. All right? This house was built in 19, uh, 1902. Sorry, 1905. Could have been 05, because he left Beverly Square West in 1904. So this is 1902. 305 Rugby Road. I was living across the street. Not 1905. Right? Uh, um, this house was paid for by Mr. Guggenheim. Guggenheim Museum. It was a wedding present for his daughter, Peggy. Okay? Yeah. 190, now I got the date. 1901, the first year that he started to develop Beverly Square West. 1901, Guggenheim bought, paid for, for his daughter, Peggy, as a wedding present. 11 years later, in 1912, he went down with the Pac Man. You, you remember that on the walking tour? He came on my walking tour how many years ago? It was about 20 least, years ago? About 10 years ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And by the way, this tree, you see it right there? It's still there today. Just a little bit bigger. That's a Norway maple. All right. Direct, oh, by the way, the house behind it is, this is Rugby Road. The house behind it, that's the rear of the house under construction on Marlboro Road. That's 316 Marlboro Road. There's one of the workers up on scaffolding right there. All right? That house sold for $9,975. Okay? Big house. Now, I lived across the street from 1978 to 1986, and this is the house that my wife and I lived in. Now, this was built as a 15-room, one-family home in 1901. Okay. This tree is still there. This tree is on our neighbor's lawn. The house next door is not built there yet. Okay? All right. Uh, Rita and George Landberg live there. And uh, by the way, their son, Danny Landberg, was the football coach for the Erasmus football team. And during Hurricane Sandy, he and his wife, with their baby, were evacuated from their house in Rockaway on a rowboat. And Danny jumped out of the rowboat, ran, ran, couldn't run, the water was way steep, back to the house, and got his playbook for the football team. They won the city championship. <laughs> <laughs> and he's won it five times already. 
and he's going to, I'm sure college coaches, are going to, okay, college is going to be looking for this guy, okay? So this was built as a one family, 15 room home. Um, you know the, the music, dancing in the dark, that's entertainment, okay? The man that lived in this house in the 1920s, his last name was Schwartz. He was the grandfather of composer Arthur Schwartz, who wrote Dancing in the Dark and Dance Entertainment. And he was also um, the, the um, grandfather of Jonathan Schwartz, who, who he, I don't know, he, I don't think he's on the radio anymore, but he, Jonathan Schwartz was a big Frank Sinatra fan. He played a lot of Sinatra, Frank Sinatra music. So, in 1938, the owners of the house, the new owners, converted it into a two-family house. So my wife and I rented, from 1978 to 1986, the downstairs apartment, the upstairs was a nine-room duplex. So we had three bedrooms, a living room, a dining room, an eating kitchen, the whole backyard to ourselves, grew vegetables, all right, and our own washer and dryer in the basement. And when we moved in there in 1978, we were paying $350 rent. <laughs> By 1986, we were paying 650, but it was going to go up to 900, which, which was the going rate. So we decided we have to buy a house. So we didn't have enough money because these houses, the real estate was going up. Okay, so my parents, my brother, and our money, we moved 15 minutes south from Flatbush to Flatlands. Okay, and uh, we're in the house now. It's 1986. Well, because all okay. paid, okay? Now, I told you before that Mr. Ackerson sold from Argyle to Rugby, he sold the land to the city to build PS 139. This picture is 1905. The school opened in 19, September 14, 1903. The principal was a Mr. Sprague, who had a huge handlebar mustache. Okay, look, I told you. I have a book, Flatfish of Today, published in 1908, full of the developers, the builders, the women of Flatbush, um, the churches, the schools, everything, and stories. And there's a picture of the principal, Mr. Sprague, with this huge handlebar mustache. And notice the dress for the day, the long coats. This little boy wearing Indian feathers on his head here. And this is Argyle Road. Again, notice plenty of parking, 1905. Okay. And let's see what did it, do I have another one? Yes. This is Cortelia Road, actually pronounced Cordelieu, for those of you who know Brooklyn, named after Jacques Cordelieu, who came in the 1600s. Okay? And uh, and here are the trolley tracks. By the way, this is a postcard. It's a black and white photograph. And if you ever see the old postcards that have color in them, there was no color film back then. This is 1910, no color film. An artist hand colors the black and white photos, and they run off hundreds of postcards. But what the artist does sometimes is they add things or they leave things out. There's the trolley car, but where are the wires? <laughs> right? Not there. Okay, so this, and, and this is a commercial street. The school I just showed you is right here on this corner. This is Rugby Road, you go down here, okay? And uh, the third house is where we live. And, and we're back here. Okay, next. Now, Mr. Atkinson, was finished with Beverly Square West from 01 to 04. He bought a large piece of property from, Miss, uh, from George and Elizabeth Fisk, F-I-S-K-E. And he paid, remember what he paid for Beverly Square West? The Captain Lot, $83,000 for about 12 acres. I don't know what the acreage for Fisk Terrace was, but Mr. Atkinson paid $285,000 for the land, which was very wooded. 
Okay? And there was a train station right there. This picture is from Echo. Okay? This is Avenue H. It's very easy in Brooklyn to get around. The streets are all numerical or alphabetized. Not all, but a good part of Brooklyn. Very easy to get around. All right? So that's the train station. Okay? Here are the tracks on the street. And incidentally, this is the end of Victorian Fathers, right here, from here north <coughs> to to Katie Avenue near, near, near the parade grounds, Prospect Park. That's Victorian Flatbush. So when the developer, when the railroad had to put the tracks down, the people buying these expensive homes for nine ten thousand dollars in Prospect Park South, Bobby Square West, Dickness Park. Have you heard of Dickness Park? Have you heard of it? That's also a landmark. Um, in fact, Tom Hanks did a movie there just a couple of years ago. I'll tell you what's moving in just a minute. All right. Um, they, at the end of Victorian Flatbush, they said, you know, they put the tracks down. But once you got to the end, from that point all the way to Brighton Beach, it's all elevated. Because the people down there didn't have the kind of housing that the developers and builders were doing in Flatbush. So, they didn't have the, the know-how to really to protest and you can't put that in our backyard, and they did, <laughs> all right? So, a horse and a wagon, that's the original train station, all right? It's called the Fisk Terrace Station. Today it's known as the Avenue H Station. Oh, by the way, if you were to walk Avenue H about 10 or 12 blocks that way, due east, you come to the campus of Brooklyn College. My alma mater. Okay? Now the next picture is going to show you what happened when Mr. Atkinson bought the property. Okay? First I'm going to show you this picture. I didn't have a chance to enlarge the, the next two pictures because I just located them yesterday. So I want to show you. You saw the, the, the uh, station house. Mr. Atkinson built his real estate office to sell the homes of this Paris. Okay? He built this, and on it it says, This Paris, TV Action Company, New York office, 140 Nassau Street in Manhattan. That was his main office. But he did have an office right here in Flatbush. This was his Flatbush office. Okay? It looks the same today. Okay? Because today, it's not an office anymore. It was built with a, with a fireplace and offices for the, the uh, Atkinson's real estate company to sell the homes. The fireplace was there from 1905 when, it was, when this, this was built as his office until 1908 when the office was taken over by the Brighton Beach Railroad. Well, the railroad didn't need the offices there because it was now a railroad station. So they took out the fireplace and put a cast iron potbelly stove to heat it, using the same chimney that the original structure had. Okay? My wife grew up in Brighton Beach and went to Brooklyn College also, and she would get off at Avenue H and walk several blocks over to the campus go to school at Brooklyn College. And she remembers the cast iron pot belly store because it was there from 1908 until 1970. And then it was removed. In 2003, I got a call from Community Board 14, which happens to be adjacent to the station house. Oh, by the way, this is the sales office. That picture, this is 1906, this picture, by the way. This picture is 1908. The Atkinson sign is gone. He left Brooklyn, came here, right words, okay? And now, this became the station, all right? In 2003, the MTA, 
wanted to tear it down and build a modern structure. Of course, they said, we don't repair wooden station houses because they're fire hazards. Well, Community Board 14 called me up, and their office is right next door here on East 14th Street right here. I said, Ron, you got to come. MTA wants to tear down the station. Bring your stuff with you. I have the blueprints from 1905 when it was an office, OK? And I had these pictures to show what the MTA had, their architect, with a big billboard showing what the new station would look like, right? Well, the office was overflowing out into the street. The meeting was there. The Post, the News, the Times. My quote in the New York Times the next day, and by the way, the MTA wanted to raise fares because they were leading poverty. And yet they wanted to spend so much money to tear it down and build a new station house. So I said, you know what? After I showed them all the evidence, all right, that you claim it's a fire hazard. I said, the fireplace was taken out in 1908. Potbelly Store was taken out in uh, 1970. And 97 years, that's in 2003, 97 years, there's never been a fire. So the incendiary devices that caused the fire are gone. And I still want to tear it down? Well, the community of Fisk Terrace and West Midwood, which is on the other side of the tracks, which Atkinson built as well, protested vehemently. Well, we got the New York Landmarks Commission involved. And we made a copy for them of the blueprints and the photographs. And we did a walkthrough with them, the neighborhood and the station house. And in less than a year, they landmarked it. They can't tear it down. It's still standing and it looks exactly the way it is in this picture. Except they spent a lot of money to, uh, to do it. I told them, look, tighten a few screws, paint it, and put a new roof on it. That's all it needs. They restored it completely. Okay? It's magnificent. And by the way, and they, you see the open porch? They put three rocking chairs on the porch. But they bolted it down so nobody can rock on the <laughs> This is a 1910 postcard, okay? Avenue H Station, Brighton Beach Railroad, Fisk Terrace, Flatbush, New York, okay? And there it is. And it looks exactly like this today. This is 1910, okay? Now. Glenwood Road, 
also with the letter G. Remember, everything's al alphabetical in the area. Very easy to get along. I want you to, and you can see how wooded the area is. And you see this tree that's a little dead at the top right there? Keeping your eye on that. This picture was taken in September, September of 1905. We're now going to go to April 1906 to drain that tree. April 1906, taken from the same spot as the tree. And these are Atkinson's houses being built. East 17th Street had a center mall. There are several streets in the 20 flat which that have these malls in the middle. Um, Albemarle Road has it, D17 Street has it, and there's one other, I forget which one. All right? So you can see the home, and, and he kept a lot of the trees that were there. Okay? And the next picture, oh, you see this house with the turret right there? Right there? There it is, in a 1910 postcard. And you can see the postmark bleeding through the postcard. All right? And all these are one block long dead end streets. And when you get to dead end street, what do you find? The railroad tracks, the subway line, right next to the tracks. You want to get into the city? You have the Avenue H station, the Newkirk station, Cortelli Road, Beverly Road. Incidentally, the Cortelli Road and Beverly Road stations are the two closest stations in the entire New York City subway system. They're one block apart. One block apart. All right. What? Sorry. Did they stop at the mall? They stop at every one of them. Yes. Well, Avenue H is a local stop. Newkirk Avenue and Church Avenue are local and express stops. Okay. And here's the street again. The, the tree, rather, right there. All right. This is Glenwood Road, and you can see Glenwood Road with the mall on it. So Glenwood Road has the mall, E17 has it. And notice right where I'm pointing, the house that was going to be built here. And I'm going to show you the blueprint. This is the Fisk Terrace blueprint from 19, January 23rd, 1907. This is the blueprint. The lots, a lot of them were sold already. A lot of our written as so, all right? But this empty lot right where I'm pointing, right over here. 1666 Glenwood Road. You live there? Charles Ebbets. Ah, Ebbets Field, the Brooklyn Dodgers. All right, Charles Ebbets lives right there, okay? He, he died in 1925, all right? Um, I'm old enough to have seen Jackie Robinson play at Ebbets Field. One third of my basement is Brooklyn Dodgers memorabilia. All right? Um, three, week, three weeks, a little less than three weeks ago, a month ago, I got a call from a producer from the Tokyo Broadcasting System. Baseball is huge in Japan. There are two pitches on the Los Angeles Dodgers. All right, Ohei Otani, somebody who follow baseball, and Yama, Yamamoto, all right? Yamamoto just got injured, so he's out for a little while. They were told that the team they're playing for came from Brooklyn. They had no idea at all. So the producer, who, by the way, has been living in New York since 2006, all right? Because the Tokyo Broadcasting System by the way, which is, by the way, the biggest TV station in Japan. Um, uh, the producer had seen me on another TV show about seven or eight years ago where a local cable station in Brooklyn did a story about Evans Field and the Brooklyn Dodgers and came to my home, interviewed me in my basement with my, all my stuff on display, not all my stuff, but some of it on display. So the producer saw that about seven years ago so he called me up and he said, we want to do a story so that Otani and Yamamoto can see where the team came from. And, they did the, and, this, and it already aired in Japan. It already aired in Japan. 
So they used my photographs, and I took them to where Ebbets Field was, the 22-story apartment house, the Ebbets Field Apartments. And I sit, and we stood in the parking lot on Bedford Avenue, and I said, right where we're standing, this was Wright Field, right here. We're standing in Wright Field, all right? And I showed them photographs, and I said, you see that end of the building over there? And I showed the photograph, and I said, that's where this, the double deck center field stands were located, right there. Right. And they, by the way, the cameraman didn't speak English. The producer spoke perfect English, okay? So this is the, the 1907 blueprint for this terrace, okay? Um, this is the original deed to Fisk Terrace. There were several different deeds. This is one of them. I didn't bring all of them. This is, it says, the Fisk Terrace Company to TB Atkinson Construction Company, deed dated June 8, 1905. So from 1905 to 1908, he was developing Fisk Terrace. And most of his homes were on East 17th and East 18th. Okay? Um, and then he sold other lots to other builders who filled in other lots, because then he started to think he's moving out here, the right waters, all right? A couple more pictures. This is another view of East 17th Street with the mall in the middle, and these are some of Atkinson's houses, and you can see the size of these houses. These are all one-family homes. But he did build two family homes, not attached, but detached homes on Argyle Road in Beverly Square West. He had three of them. There were a couple on Marlboro Road. And in West Midwood, uh, on Westminster Road, he, so he sold, in one year, 42 homes. 42 homes. And those were two family, two family homes. Detached homes. And before I moved to Rugby Road and Beverly Square West, I lived in one of those, one of those homes on Westminster Road. Okay? So there's a view of East 17th Street. And this, again, is one of those one block long dead ends, dead ends at the subway tracks. There are, and those little streets are called Coven Court, Waldorf Court, very English sounding names. Again, a colorized postcard of East 17th Street with the mall, all right? And remember the house that had that dome on? There it is again, right there. Are they garages or service roads? Um, eventually, garages were put in because there was space for driveways, but there were no driveways when the houses were being built, all right? By the way, a couple of the homes being built especially the very larger homes, like in Prospect Park South, um, they had carriage houses for horses and wagons. There's a, 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 a Catherine and uh, Gordon Berlin, who lived on uh, Marlboro Road, 197 Marlboro Road in Prospect Park South, not an Atkinson house. Um, they're members of our synagogue in Flatbush, all right? And you go into the, ki the kitchen in the back of the house, and there's a little, little balcony, the back wall. You step down to the balcony, and you open the door, and you're looking down into the carriage house, the rear of the house. It's not a carriage house now, it's all used for storage. Wood wall, wood floor, wood walls, wood ceiling. And that was the carriage house for the carriage, not the horses. The horses were stable nearby. One of those stables still exists near Prospect Park. Still there, so you can go horseback riding in Prospect Park. Still, okay. This is a 1910 colorized postcard, and this is a postcard that was a a very long postcard, not the usual little rectangle one. This was a long postcard, so I made it into this 11 by 17 print. And there's that house with the little dome at the top right there again, all right? And there's the, the mall in the middle. And these are all Atkinson's houses in Fisk Terrace on East 17th Street between Avenue H and Glenwood Road, okay? And uh, 
Yes. This is East 18th Street. East 18th Street, Fifth Terrace. This is, I think that's in the booklet. Okay. And here's a woman living the baby carriage. I think that's Mrs. Murphy right there. All right. And let's see. This this house right here, this one. How many of you put mayonnaise on sandwiches like a BLT or something? This is where the Holman family lived. Right there. So you had the Hellman family, you had uh, Charles Ebbets, and if you go into Dickers Park, which is another of those landmark communities a few blocks away, um, you, know, you wouldn't notice if you're not from Brooklyn. The, have you ever heard of Ebinger Bakeries? Uh, someone's nodding. The Ebinger family lived on East 19th Street, uh, and uh, their blackout cake was to die for. Unbelievable. And they had their main bakery was on Bedford Avenue, um, right next to Erasmus High School on Bedford, on Bedford Avenue. And uh, the main bakery, that building is still there. Ebbing just doesn't exist anymore. But the top is still in great Ebbing. All right? And their family is still in Brooklyn. They're buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Okay. So, so is Charles Evans. He's in there also. So, so is Leonard Bernstein. All right. Um, the cemetery opened in 1838, and the very famous and the infamous, like uh, what's his name, Tammany Hall. What was that? Who who was the 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 guy who cheated everybody? He's, he's very with too. All right. So this is East 18th Street, and these are again Atkinson's houses. Now, so this gives you an idea of what Victorian Flatbush is all about. Oh. Here's another postcard view. This is East 18th Street, East 18th Street, Glenwood Road, and there are one, two, three, four children standing next to the tree. This is 1910, okay? And I told you that Victorian Flatbush has been host Hollywood East. Um, how many ever saw the movie Sophie's Choice? That was filmed at 101 Rugby Road, okay? And here, these are movie lobby cards. There's Meryl Streep, Kevin Klein, and Peter McNichol. This is 101 rugby. I was living in 312 rugby. So when I got out of school at 3 o'clock, I rushed home, went out over there, stood behind the ropes, and watched the film. Okay? This is filmed in 1982. Okay? And it's based on a true story. And by the way, when I do my walking tours, whether it's Coney Island or Black Page or Sheep's at Bay or Victorian Flavish, I also do Brooklyn Heights, um, I bring in large photos with me. So if we're standing, like I showed you a picture of Marlboro Road before with nothing on it, all right? I say, okay, everybody stand right here and look past me and hold the picture. That's the street you're on right now, okay? In 1910. So they can see, and I said, wait a minute, all those houses are still here. They're all still there. Okay? So I always bring these pictures with me on my walking tours. So there they are. And one of the scenes in the movie is Kevin Klein sitting at the curb. And if you remember the movie, Sophie, during World War II, the Nazis got her. She had two children. And they forced her to work for them, doing whatever. And they said, to her, pick which child you want to keep. I think she chose her son, I believe it was. And uh, it's a true story. When the war ended, uh, she came to Brooklyn. And she stayed in a rooming house called the Pink Palace, which happened to be two blocks away from the house used by Universal Studios. The Flatbush Development Corporation was formed in 1975 to save the community. Because there was a lot of crime in the 70s. Banks were redlining, weren't getting mortgages. But people who had bought houses there, 
$40,000 in the 70s. And they said, we just make this big investment. So some of these new homeowners formed the Flatbush Development Corporation. And one of them was a lawyer, one of them was a judge who bought the houses. And some of these people are still around. They're still around. That organization saved Flatbush. Okay? So the Flatbush Development Corporation took the staff from Universal Studios around the neighborhood. Now the original King Palace, a block, two blocks away on Caton Avenue, that's not there anymore. So they chose this house here at 101 Rugby Road. And of course, they had to paint the hot pink for the movie. All right? Of course, the rooming house uh, that Sophie stayed in in the 1940s after the war was, was painted pink. None of the scenes in the movie were done inside. It's like been inside. And believe me, the inside of that house is not like a rooming house. It has 32 stained glass windows. It has uh, the chimney is just barely visible right there. And when you walk into the entrance and walk about 10 steps, turn, and there's a stairway. And when you get to the five steps up, you're on a, on a, on a, a stand on landing. And the stained glass windows there, but the, it's all like very light oak wood. And it almost looks like if there was a steering wheel for a sailing ship. That's what it looks like. And the people that were living here at the time when this was filmed, um, uh, what, um, Philip and, I forgot her first name, Philip and her husband, uh, and, her, and her, his um, wife, um, Philip Toya, T-O-I-A, he was a deputy mayor under Mayor Koch, when Mayor Koch was mayor of New York. They got paid $15,000 for the use of the house for 10 days of filming, plus $1,000 a day for the 10 days. So they got $25,000 for the use of the house. And a little extra thrown in, because the people didn't want to, on the block, didn't want to look at a pink house all the time. But the color that they had painted had to be okay by the Landmarks Commission, because the area was landmarked in 1978, and the movie was made in 1982. Okay? So, so I bring these with me. Uh, in Vitness Park, several blocks south, which is all landmark, developed by a guy named um, Lewis Pounds. Lewis Pound lived in Beverly Square East in an Atkinson house, all right? 317 East 17th Street. And when it was found out that the privately run railroad was going to build an elevated railroad, Lewis Pounds and the people that were buying these homes in Vitness Park and Beverly Square West and Prosper Park South, they all got together and they protested vehemently. And of course, the railroad said, well, the only option is to put the tracks 16 feet down, uncovered. And it's been that way ever since. In fact, the guy, the engineer working on the northern end of that project, his name was Charles, Charles Crawford. And there's a picture of him in that 1908 book I have. They, and by the way, the railroad wanted to get rid of the Beverly Road Station because it was only one block away from the Cortelli Road Station. And they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't want to walk all the way over to Church Avenue, an extra two blocks, or all the way to Cortelli Road. So they said, okay, we'll keep the station. They were so pleased with Mr. Crawford that when the project was completed in 1908, the Prospect Park South Association threw him a banquet in the ballroom in the house on the third floor of a house at 1305 Albemarle Road, all right? The house had 22 rooms and a ballroom on the third floor, all right? And another movie was filmed there. Reversal of Fortune with Glenn, Co Glenn Co Close and Jeremy Irons was filmed in that house, okay? And about, just before the pandemic, I think about six years ago, maybe, how many of you saw the movie Bridge of Spies? Okay, with Tom Hanks, true story, true story. So in the, in the movie, Tom Hanks plays a Brooklyn lawyer for a law firm, a New York law firm. And remember the U-2 pilot that was shot down, all right, and the Russians had him? Well, they wanted to make a spy switch in Berlin, all right, before the wall was torn down in Berlin, okay? So, they used this Brooklyn lawyer to 
would be the go-between to do the negotiating with Russia and with the United States. Well, Tom Hanks, or the lawyer in the movie, he couldn't tell his wife. So he said, listen, I'm going on a fishing trip with the guys. We'll be, I'll be away for about a week, and, and we're going to London. All right, in England, on a special for the, for the guys. And of course, you couldn't tell her exactly what's going on. So she said, well, when you're, when you're there, you got to buy it in one of the groceries. you got to get me this one particular thing. you got to buy it in London. My wife and I were in bed one night watching a movie on TV. All right? And I didn't know that which house was used in the movie. I knew that they filmed the movie, but I didn't know. So we're watching the movie. And at the end of the movie, he comes home. And he's walking down East 17th, East 17th Street, 480, 480, 40, East, East 17th Street. And as he turns, the camera shows the front of the house and the house next to it. And I jumped out of bed. I said, Phyllis, that's Lena Cole's old house. <laughs> that's part of my walking tour. That's part of my walk drive. I went past it all the time. All right? So, and Tom Hanks, by the way, because uh, we have friends that live on the block there, and he said Tom Hanks was a wonderful person. He took pictures with everybody, he gave autographs, um, and they were filming there for several days. And, he, and of course, he gets into the house, and, uh, and as he's walking into the house, kids are watching TV, and they said, Mom, Mom, come on, you've you got to come take a look, look. And they're talking about this, the switch, which is on a bridge in Berlin in the winter. And the two spies, the American spy and the Russian spy, they walk past each other on the bridge. Bridge of Spies is the movie. If you, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. All right? Well, that's a little bit of Victorian Flatbush. Um, there's a lot more to Victorian Flatbush. There are more movies and TV shows. Uh, Blue Bloods has filmed um, a lot over there. Um, uh, there it, there's a couple of years ago we were watching it. Uh, watching Blue Bloods. And uh, Reagan is coming out of the house with his partner. How many of you watch Blue Bloods? All right? And, uh, and they start walking across the street. And as they walk, and now the camera pans back and you see the whole street. I said, that's our Gal Road. That's another one of the streets. So they walk down. And the sycamore trees tower over the street. And that's what the developers want. A park-like setting with trees towering over it. And the trees are on the lawns, not at the curb. Many, some of them are built it with the trees at the curb. All right? But a lot of it doesn't. Okay. Any questions? How many houses did he build in the area? Um, Beverly Square West, I think, had 121. I don't know how many Beverly Square East. And all those large houses, he didn't do any affordable housing? No, they were, they were all big houses. And the, um, they all had fireplaces and the, the brickwork and the fireplaces came from a foundry in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, oh yes, if you go down, when he bought Catherine Lott's farm, the farm was about 10 or 12 acres from Cortelia Road, 600 feet north towards Beverly Road. It didn't go the entire block because it, that first picture that I showed you clearly shows this. Yeah. If you look at the very, up to this point right here, it's all built up. Those homes were built from the 1890s to 1901. So this is Catherine Lott's farm, right here, about 10 or 12 acres. The houses 600 feet north of that point to Beverly Road were built by different individual builders. Okay? So those predate Ackerson's by a couple of years. All right? So um, uh, Beverly Square West is 1901 to 1904, Fish Terrace 1905 to 1908, and West Midwood, he only did 
he bought the land from the Germania Real Estate Company, called Germania because the president of the company was German, his name was Henry Meyer, and uh, if you go over to Brooklyn College, right off Flappish Avenue, there's a little street that cuts in, it's called Hillel Place. Originally, it was Germania Place, and that's where Mr. Meyer had his sales office. And I have a photograph hanging in my living room, blown up this big. And the photograph was taken in 1895 when um, Mr. Meyer uh, started to develop the South Midwood part of Victoria and Flatbush. And um, the sale, his sales office is in the picture. If you know, how many of you know the junction where Flatbush Avenue and Nostrand Avenue cross? Anyone know that? It's right, you're right near Brooklyn College, okay? That's the scene I have hanging in my living room. The photograph was taken in 1895. Flatbush Avenue is unpaved. There's a trolley car. No Street Avenue trolley is cutting diagonally across. And that little street at the very left of the photograph in the picture in 1895 is Germania Place. But Hillel Place, it was changed to by Brooklyn College. It was the, um, uh, there's a Jewish organization called Hillel, and their building by the campus is right on that street. So it was changed many, many years ago. The college campus was built there in 1937. Right. And the original college campus was, was in downtown Brooklyn in 1930. So they, the city of New York, the city university, bought the land right on the Flatbush Midwood border and they developed the Flatbush Midwood campus of Brooklyn College in 1937. Okay. Any questions at all? Okay. Thank you all very much.